Tabernacle, Lord, among your people, let your great Shekinah be made known. In the midst of joy and celebration, let your glory and majesty be shown. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the God of chosen dwelling place of Zion. We will lift up our praise to you alone. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the God of Israel. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Honor and glory to the Lord. Honor and glory to the Lord. Glory. 
should kind of be made known in the midst of joy and celebration. Let your glory and majesty be shown. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the God of Israel. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Honor and glory to the Lord. Honor and glory to the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the God of Israel. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Honor and glory to the Lord. Honor and glory to the Lord. Honor and glory to the Lord. Of your holiness I will bow before your throne for your love is everlasting Lord I will worship you Adonai, you are my righteousness. Elohim, you are my king. In the beauty of your holiness, I will lift my voice and sing. I have sought you in your holy place from the dry and weary land. I have tasted of your kindness, Lord, and the mercy of Let me feel your sweet caress. Wrap me in your arms of love. I want my life to be a holy place. For my Abba above. In the beauty of your holiness, I will ever praise your name. You were and are, shall always be for eternity. Sitting on his holy throne, and he shall reign forevermore. In the beauty of your holiness, I will worship you, my Lord. your holiness I will worship you we will worship you I will worship you oh Lord Ooh, 
ever worship you, my Okay, you're good. That's one. All right, you want to turn? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, awesome to be back to actually dig in. Uh, chapter nine again is our focus. We're actually just jumping into chapter nine of Revelation. Um, in fact, when we actually get to a little bit of study tonight, we'll actually back up to chapter eight a little bit um, to get some context. I think that's important for us to understand. Um, and part of tonight will be the idea of, um, I don't know whether you're on the internet room, how sold you are on the idea of what is held in regard to what is taught about it, right? Um, we're going to um, unravel a little bit of that in regard to what the scripture says and what the actual words are. Uh, because we're getting into chapter 9, it's going to talk about this pit. Um, how many of you have heard of um, bore, which is what it would be called in Hebrew, or in some cases, sheol? Um, not many people in the world have heard those words before. Um, but the pit is spoken of over and over, both in Torah and the prophets and in Psalms, about a place of the dead. Um, Interesting enough, um, while those words are not mentioned, every time that those two words come up, we just automatically just put in the word hell. So I don't know if you guys know it, but the actual word hell does not actually happen in Scripture, both in Greek or in Hebrew. Um, translators had an idea in regard to Dante, and they decided to translate using that word, but that word does not actually exist um, in the scriptural vernacular in that regard. So we're going to sort of dig into that a little bit today. Um, that'll give us a foreshadowing and, and a connection to what we'll dig into in, in regard to the bottomless pit. So um, continue to keep individuals in prayer. We have a lot of individuals um, going through a lot of hard times. And uh, the blessing is that what we know is that Yah is not a God of today, He's a God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And um, we may have question marks about tomorrow, and I know there's a number of individuals out there that do, um, but he doesn't have question marks about tomorrow. Um, all those tomorrows, there's already filled in plan and time, right? And so for us, it's the issue of continue to keep him in prayer and then just follow in his footsteps, wherever he's leading us, wherever he's taking us, um, and seek to praise him no matter if we're on the mountaintop or going through the valley. So keep those individuals in prayer. Um, again, high days are coming, so please be aware of that. They're a little less than two months away. Um, in fact, we're starting on the, the downside of the month, so we'll be getting ready for seeing our new moon, which will be the sixth um, month. And then we'll be literally a month from there. Um, again, prepare both your spirit and mind because as we get ready for these days, you're meeting with him. Again, Shabbat, he says, I'll meet you where you are. But during the hogs, his feast days, he says, you're going to come to him. And while we're not going to Jerusalem, no. We know in regard to Messiah, it says, the Father seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. 
and we understand that he's enthroned in our praises. And so we seek to, in our soul or our spirit, to rise up and to be with him in the heavenlies with all the, the, the angels in that regard as a, as a part of these feast days. And so we prepare ourselves to make that journey. Even though we're not making a physical one, we are making a spiritual one that we're prepared and ready. Okay, So just be aware of that as well. And know that this season is always a season of testing, and it's always a season of challenges, because the enemy's goal is to steal away um, the opportunity for us to be able to meet with him, or to be able to have our joy when we go to meet with him. Um, there's always obstacles in the way, so we sort of get ourselves in a prayerful place to be able to, all right, I see the obstacles, but I know the greater goal to be with him. Um, with that, let me go ahead and open us in prayer and we can get started. <sighs> Elohei Avraham, Elohei Yitzhak, Elohei Yaakov. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, is who bestows steadfast love and goodness and is master of all. Father, we come before you... Um, wanting and desiring to um, know you more, to dig into your words, to um, shine your light a little clearer in the world that we live in. Um, we have many questions, um, and uh, we know that you will give us answers as in your time and not ours. And that's challenging for us and a blessing for us at times. We know that your love for us is deep and wide, as well as for those who um, don't acknowledge you yet. We know that your very words not only are our life, but they are the path into your presence, both now and forever. We know that we see your love in the promises that you gave to the covenant to Adam, to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to Joshua, to all the prophets. We also see your love clearly in the giving of your son, your lamb, an older brother that came forward for us to redeem us from the world that we had gone off to, each of us being prodigals and leading us home. As we prepare for the feast, Father, may we look again at that story of the prodigal and know that each of us are making our way back home. And Isaiah says that we need to take words with us. And part of those words is to examine our life and to seek repentance for the things that, that broke your word, that didn't live up to what you were asking us to do. Father, you send so much love into our life, so much truth, surrender blessings. You deserve so much. We want those blessings to start in our heart and rise up through our very words and then more specifically that you would paint those words in, the, um, in our life for others to see. That we are assigned to the world of your grace, your power, your strength, and your faithfulness. Amen and amen. All right, so our song is the same song we started last Shabbat, which is by Aaron Schust. Um, song is pretty easy to um, remember in regard to words because it is Psalm 23. Again, the blessing I find from this version, which is a version that just came out in the last month or so, um, is the idea of the focusing on the wandering soul. We all have wandering souls. And then as you come near the end, it's sort of, 
builds up to the point I will be live in his house forever. So, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green fields. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside water still. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. For the sake of his name, he guides my wayward soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow, Fear no evil, for you are here. Your rod and your staff will protect and comfort. You restore my soul. You restore my soul. For the sake of your name, you guide my wayward soul. You prepare me a table. In the presence of my enemies, you anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. You prepare me a table in the presence of my enemies, you anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow all the days of my life and forever I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. Whoa. And forever I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. Whoa. shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green fields the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he leads me beside water still and bring us to that place um, those quiet waters and those green pastures we're here tonight because of that journey of you bringing us to this place. Not this physical location, but into your kingdom to see it as it is, not as the world has distorted it. And we are very blessed. We'll never deserve that you opened our eyes. But we seek to lift you on high, Father, with the rest of our life, with all that we have all of our heart, with all of our soul, and all of our strength. Amen, amen. All right. So you guys have chapter 9, hopefully there in front of you. Um, as per our expectation today, what I will do is we're going to read through, is it 21 verses? Something like that. Um, if I have a sort of some points I want to point out, We'll do that, and then I'll give you some time to sort of dig in, and then we'll take anything 
to write down and talk about as you prepare for study. So, um, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and of course that's our trumpet or shofar, and I saw a star fall from heaven into or unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose smoke of the pit, and a smoke of the great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came, it's okay, And there came out of the smoke of locusts, sorry, out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them were given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now I'm going to make a point of that just for a moment. Um, we hear over and over the point of the mark of the beast that will be on the forehead and on the hand. We don't here is much the idea that there is a seal that is going to be on our hand and on our forehead. Um, the Torah specifically speaks of it in regard to Passover. It says Passover will be a sign in between your eyes and between, on your hands. Also, when we get to the Via Hafta, the Shema and the Via Hafta of Deuteronomy, it says his word will be a sign upon our hands and between our eyes, right? So when we talk about this seal, what this is saying is that there's already a seal on the children of God, on their foreheads. And it's more than just a physical seal. It's our actions. It's how we treat others. Um, it's what sets us apart to be different. And not wholly in regard to we're righteous, but different from the world, right? Um, so that's really important. We'll, we'll dive into that in the next few studies this idea of that seal that's happening um, and how it's put on us. And then, to them it was given, this is verse 5, they should not kill them. This is the ones that don't have the seal. Um, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was in the torment of a scorpion um, when he strikes a man. And so you get this point of these locusts coming and the pain that's coming. You're going to see the word five months. We're going to see it in a minute come up back up again. Verse 6, in those days men shall seek death and they shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death will flee from them. Verse 7, the shape of the locusts were like on the horses prepared for battle, and on their heads were crowns of gold, and their faces were the faces of men. And they had hair on the hair as hair of women, and their teeth were that of lions. And they had breastplates, and the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And their tails were like scorpions with, uh, that were stings, and their tails and the power was to hurt men for five months. So we're going to see this concept of five months to five months, and it's all comparison talking about these locusts. Now we go to verse 11. And they all had a king over them, which is the angel or the messenger of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, Greek um, tongue is Apollyon. Again, probably words we don't speak of. Of course, my first question when I see this is, it's interesting that you actually have a, um, a scripture that is actually now translating these two words in two languages. So we get the feeling already that John wrote this is not only speaking to those that are Hebrews, but he's also speaking to Greeks, right? Um, verse 12, one woe is past. And behold, two more, two woes are hereafter. Now verse 13. The sixth messenger sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And I'm just going to clarify this. This is interesting to me because usually we hear the voice from the ark. We see that in regard to the tabernacle. This golden altar with four horns is, of course, the altar of incense. Now that altar of incense is right between the holy place where the table and the menorah are and going into the Holy of Holies. And that's where his voice is being heard. So this connects back to the chapter before when incense would go up there, which is meant to be intercession or prayers of the saints. Um, saying to the sixth messenger who had the trumpet, loose the four angels 
which are bound the great river Euphrates. I can't wait to, to dive into that one. Um, so you have four angels or messengers that are bound in the great river Euphrates. And they're going to be set free. Um, these four messengers were loosed, which were prepared for, an hour, uh, prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. Basically a fancy way of saying there's a, a set seal on time, month, year, and day. And when that day hits, the seal will be broken and they will be set free to go do the job that they were set to do, which is a third of mankind will be judged and killed in that regard. Um, Let's see. Um, all right, verse 16. A number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, and I heard the, the number of them. And I saw the horses in the vision, and on them sat on them, having breastplates of fire. And now you get into the different stones. Jasnith and brimstone, the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. Um, by these three are the third part of the men killed by the fire, by smoke, and by brimstone, which are issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like serpents, and their heads with them they do hurt. Verse 20, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, and notice the point, they're already telling you that while this is giving you a metaphor of what's happening, these are plagues. Um, Yet repented not of the work of their hands, that they should not worship um, demons, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. We're definitely going to dive into that. Yeshua talks about this when he speaks to the Pharisees. Um, you've ever heard of the, um, the blind shepherd, right? What's going to happen to the sheep that follow the, the blind shepherd? Well, they're going to fall into the pit. They're going to deal with whatever struggles. Um, Deuteronomy says also, we'll be cast on the, um, the, the idols, and we become like the idols. So if the idols are um, blind, then guess what we are? We're blind. If the idols are deaf, well, then we are deaf in regard to the truth. Um, if those idols, which of course are just made of things, are dead, thus our soul is in that state at that point. Um, verse 21, neither repented they of their murders, sorceries, nor fornication, nor their thefts. Um, and that's a really important point because when we talk about plagues and this judgment that's going on, um, too much of the world today is focused that, that they're coming back and your, once he comes, your fate is sealed. But what's happening here is each of these plagues are happening just like in Egypt for the moment to say, oh, you know what? I think it's time to repent. Meaning they're being sent in order for the purpose. Okay, it's bad, now it's getting worse. Okay, well now I repent. The whole point, just like in Egypt, individuals are repenting as you go because where do we get our mixed multitude from? We get our mixed multitude that come out of Egypt by those who have repented and joined over with his people ahead of time. Right? And so we understand as we look at Revelation, this is not, oh, it's sealed, they're just coming to destroy. No, he's coming to still harvest, and part of that harvest is the people that need to make decisions. Right? Um, so I think that's important for us to delve into. So here's what I want you to do. You have your chapters in front of you. Um, we're going to just do, we'll say, five minutes for you to sort of, um, and those online, go ahead and get, you can go ahead and go through to read it if you got a piece of paper, and we'll, we will post it, um, the notes page for you so you can pull and print them. But if you just go ahead, um, you're looking through the chapter, there's 21 verses. Um, you're looking for repeated words. Um, that'll give us some concepts. If you read it like, I don't understand what that means, then you have a question. So you have concept, the repeated words. Um, you have those questions. And then thirdly, if you come to like, well, this reminds me of a verse, well, then you can write yourself a note. So again, five minutes. Um, and go ahead and start, and I'll give you that time.
down to about one minute. So, let's talk about repeated words or concepts. Um, what did we find? Lots of smoke. Smoke, furnace, burning. It comes up over and over. It's coming out of certain creatures' mouths. It's coming out of the pit. Um, so we definitely see this issue of smoke um, coming out. What else? Bottomless pit. I think it's like three times, especially near the, the beginning. Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, this is not something I've heard a lot of people teach on. Um, the bottomless pit. And again, it plays an, it plays an integral role to Scripture, but um, a lot of people just say, well, he's talking about basically hell, and they just go ahead and call it that, but Scripture doesn't call it that. It just says it's a bottomless pit. Locusts. Locus. I'm glad you brought that one up. Um, these are the strangest locusts I've ever heard described, right? But we're definitely going to, to dive in because... These locusts are spoken in multiple chapters, um, Malachi, um, Haggai, um, that talk about the idea of the day of the Lord coming, and locusts are part of that day of the Lord when, when there's a darkness. Um, and there's a, more information about these locusts in those chapters, um, so we'll definitely dive into that. Um, it's also not accidental. Um, when the locusts happen in Egypt, right? Right, and it's part of the plagues. That connects back to what we saw at the end of the chapter, that these are all plagues that are happening, right? What else do we see? Yeah, like, we have this issue of um, scorpions mentioned three times. And part of that issue of the scorpions is um, people are going to be bit and this bite is going to cause such severe pain, and I don't think that there's going to be anything out there that's going to be able to, um, yeah, cure it. Because we get to that, the verse that says they'll seek death, but they'll not be able to find it. Um, so there's definitely something in it. But what I love, in, not in regard to what they're going to go through or what we're going to go through, but he's doing this, come down and said, all right, it's time for death. Boom. Judgment. It's over. But this is, comes, for, is it five months? For, for a period of five months. Like, he's doing it like, okay, kind of like the serpents in the wilderness. Remember um, Moses, the, the people were sinning, and, and Yah sent the serpents in, and they would strike them. And what I love is, they're like, well, pray that they stop. Well, what's interesting is that Yah's answer back about the, the snakes is, all right, well, put a bronze serpent up so when they bite you, you can look up at it and you won't die. So Yah's answer to the prayer was, I'm not stopping the serpents because you haven't stopped sinning, but I'll give you a way to find redemption, 
right? And of course, that bronze serpent is a representative of the serpent or sin being put on that stake, which is a foreshadowing of Messiah. And obedience, absolutely right, absolutely. What else do we see? And five is not used um, that often, so that it's um, brought up and then talked about the, the, the scorpions and what they're doing and describes them and then brings up the five again um, is an interesting point um, and something for us to dive into because it's not a common number. And if it's not a common number, there's a reason for that, right? What else? I'm going to put in, we have angels, right? You have the angel who is the commander of the locusts. You have the angels that are going to come out of the river Euphrates, right? We're actually going to see this later. Um, so, Greek thought is, would be today's thought, Right? So if we talk about anything, we would say A equals B, B equals C, A equals C. It's linear. Does that make sense? However we think. That's a Greek mentality. Hebrew mentality has never been linear. It's cyclical. So it would be like A equals C, B equals E, L equals O, and go right back to the first set of letters they started off with. My point being is this. The chapters of Revelation are not meant to be seen in different time frames. We're going to look later, as we look dive into this, that it says demons like frogs come out of the water. It's not accidental, Right? that you're going to have these angels coming out of the water at the same time. You, you can think of them as templates. We're meant to take each chapter as a template and then overlay them, because they are given to you in a sequence. You overlay them to see the connections and go, oh, now I get it, if that makes sense. So the river is the Nile, I think that's a great point. So let me just say that for those online. Um, so you have the, the Nile in Egypt, which Yah comes, and we, and we definitely see there's a lot of things to dive into because it says that Pharaoh is the serpent in that water that he has to destroy, which, of course, could connect to the blood that's there and so on. And then we have the River Euphrates connected to Babylon. And I think that's a great point. And water represents their teachings, um, their culture, their ways, right? And so... Um, Quite often, we see earlier in the chapter, those waters turn to blood, just like the, what's the very first plague in Egypt? Turn it to blood. And there's two points to that. Um, I don't know if you guys, um, everybody knows this in regard. First of all, um, you have to know that the Nile was considered the, one of the greatest gods in Egypt. And for the Nile to turn into blood when another god came in, was significant. And by the way, did you know who the servants of the Nile were? Um, the frogs. The frogs were considered like um, demigods or demons that were the servants of um, the god of the Nile. So you have the Nile, which turns to blood, and what happens to all the frogs? They come out of the water. For the Egyptians, in their psyche, they see it and go, Oh my goodness, our God is dead. Now, Yah's purpose is different. Um, I believe Yah's purpose is trying to say, well, who was thrown into that water? All the Egypt, uh, sorry, all the Israelite boys. And the blood in the water, and um, he's reminding them of their sin. Right? Frogs come in the house, go, I can hide from the sin.
right? So the water changes to blood. We see that. Then the frogs come out of the water into your houses. Well, you can try and hide from that sin, but um, you're gonna, you're gonna, if you're walking and all your house is full of frogs, um, you're going to step on one, you're going to sit on one, and now guess what? The blood is in your house. Death is in your house. Then you have um, the lice or the flies coming in, and they're sort of compared to mosquitoes. And so you hit one, and then what happens? Well, we see the blood again. Now the blood is on us. So those three plagues happen. Then Yah says, okay, now Egypt, the, the plagues are going to happen, but in the place for Israel, they're not going to happen. He sets them apart. So the three plagues happen because all the people sin. Does that make sense? Um, so, angels, water. What, what else do you guys see? One woe. So, and we're actually going to look back at chapter 8. So we have one woe. Um, but there's two more coming, right? There's two more coming. There was one woe, and then two more are coming. We're actually going to see in the previous chapter, he says, he says, woe, 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 three times. He doesn't say there's three woes, he just says it three times, which I think is interesting. All right, anything else? Two, oh, I'm sorry, two hundred thousand thousand. And I think interesting in that too is that we see um, comparing with the children of Israel, there's 144,000. Um, so this is going to be more than that. Um, so I thought that was interesting too and something to sort of look in and, and why. Um, anything else before we jump in? Yeah, so um, the chapter says that there are three um, angels that are almost imprisoned um, in that water. Four, sorry, four, thank you. Four angels that are imprisoned in that water or the river, right? And it says Yah comes and he s sets them free to go and to kill. And so, again, we think about that idea of angels always being righteous, or perfect, or right. And these specific angels, they have a specific purpose, um, and that's judgment happening. Right? Um, it makes me compare with, you know, it says in Egypt, it says that the angel of death passing through Egypt, and it's, it says Yah um, protected the house where the blood was, right? That so that the angel of death would pass over the house and it would not go in, right? So it's an, it's an interesting connection, um, at least for me. Interesting too is, you remember um, the punishment? The punishment for Satan? that he needed to eat dust forever, right? 
what are we made from? Dust. So I wonder, Yah says, oh, you want to give them death? Okay, well, you're going to come and you're actually going to, going to be like harvesting some. You're going to see death again and again and again, and you're going to be in control charge or controlling some of that. Now, of course, you know, Yah is actually in charge, but he's going to command him to do that. Again, just a wondering. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and dive in a little bit to where we're going to start. Now, what I said before, so when we talk about hell, right, um, what do you guys know, or what do many people teach about hell? Um, it's it's hot, right? So that's one thing. What else? So our soul is is tormented there forever, right? So there's no death, and 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 good. It's a good point. There's no water. So we're hot. We're praying. We want that water to come, and there's no water. Right? And we sort of connect that with the, um, the story that um, Messiah says when he says, um, oh, there's a person we're going to name Lazarus, and then there is the, the rich man, right? And then they both die. And then one, well, the rich one is very thirsty, and he wants Lazarus to give him water, but he sees him far off. Right? And he says that there's a separation um, between those places. And you can't go. You need to stay here, and he stays over there. Um, so that's, that's a good connection in regard to that thirsty. So it's hot. Your soul's tor- tormented forever. There's no death. You just are punished. No, no rest, no rest. You're just struggling forever, right? Now, I would ask, when we punish a child, the purpose is what? To teach, right? You punish to teach. You say, stop. What's the purpose of punishing all the souls forever in hell? There's no lesson. Right, I mean... Today, they would say, oh, the purpose is for us to be afraid now to not want to go. But think, like, is that from him? Like, we should be righteous because we're afraid of going to hell? Or we need to be righteous because we love him? Do you understand? For me, it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem today. Like, Many people focus on, oh, if you died today, where would your spirit go? (gasps) And they're afraid. Why are we using fear to help people into the kingdom? Do you understand? Like, why? Like, do I see in scriptures chapters or verses that show that Yah comes to make us afraid. Now, yes, Mount Sinai, but right, right, in in Scripture, it does say to fear Him, and that idea is, I think it's the same as a a parent, right? Yeah, it's all-powerful. The idea is I love my father or I love my mother. 
And when I do wrong and they come, I'm scared. But when I start, maybe I'm obeying because I don't want to be punished. But as I grow up, the purpose of obeying is not because I'm afraid. Right, because you want to love him and respect him, right? And I, and I think that's important. If I punish children, you know right and wrong. You know right. You're teaching them, showing them, right? But what you say, do... H O S hosting. Okay. Right. Right. So, first of all, let's go to Dear, just back arrow to chapter eight. Um, on your keyboard. Um, yeah, you can just click on that arrow then. Uh, the, that one there, yeah. All right, so chapter 8. Um, I want to just look at verses 8 to 13. So can you go ahead and scroll down 8 to 13? All right, 8 to 13. It says, The second angel sounded a shofar, and there was this huge mountain that was burning with fire, and it was thrown into the sea. And one-third of the water changed to blood. Right? And it says, one-third of all the animals that were in the water died, and one-third of all the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell this great star from heaven coming down and burning like a lamp. And one third of all the rivers and the springs changed. And the name of that star was called Wormwood, and that's just the same as uh, poison. And one-third of the waters changed to be poison, and then the men died because they were bitter. Right? Um, important connection is um, when Messiah goes on the tree, right? Um, he accepts the cup of wrath, right? Not the cup of salvation. He offers us the cup of salvation, but he accepts the cup of wrath. And do you remember what he was given to drink on the tree? It was vinegar, which would have been bitter. That's the, the, that was the concept or idea that he was drinking. All right. Uh, fourth angel sounded, and one-third of the sun became dark, and one-third of the moon and the stars darkened, and it was just the same as, as night. As night. And I beheld an angel flying through the heavens, saying with a loud voice, notice again, woe, woe, woe. So there's our three woes to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voice of the trumpet, three angels which are yet to sound. So he's giving us a warning that, okay, I, plagues have, are happening, yes, but the plagues coming are bad. Are you ready? Do you want to actually go through that? Now, interesting, we actually see a very similar warning um, in Egypt. 
So we're going to jump over there for a moment. So Exodus chapter 9. Okay, chapter 9, verse 13 to 21. And Yah said um, to Moses, um, wake up in the morning and go to Pharaoh um, and say to them, um, Yah, the God of the Hebrews, says you need to let his people go so he can go and serve him. For I will, my plagues will come upon your heart now and upon your servants, and upon your people, so you will know that on earth there's no one like him. For now, I will stretch out my hand, and I will smite you and your people with pestilence, which should be cut off from the earth. In this very deed, I have actually had you come and be in the world and rule right now because he's going to use Pharaoh to show the earth and all people that he is in control. So he's giving a warning. He says, I've given you plagues now. Okay, they've been happening, but now it's going to be serious. It's going to be serious. Now, can you guess when this happens? Like between which plagues? So I'm going to tell you, bloods happen, one. Frogs, two. Lice, three. Flies, four. Livestock, five. Boils, six. And now we're doing a warning before hail, which is going to be fire coming from heaven. Isn't that interesting? So I'm going to give you a warning before that happened. And we see in Revelation, he's giving a warning, and then the fire is coming down. These um, stars are coming from the heavens, right? Then what happens? Locusts. And what happens in Revelation chapter 9? We see the stars come with fire, and then darkness is going to happen, and then we're going to see the locusts happen. That's not an accident. That, that connection, that connection is, has a purpose for us to understand and see. And it's not the only connection with um, the plagues in Egypt. We'll see, again, demons like frogs from the water. We're going to see darkness happen. We're going to see um, many of the animals die. We're going to see... Um, not death of the firstborn, but death of many, right? Just like the same, like in Egypt, like there was no houses without one person dead. Those connections are for us to go, oh, I see and understand. I understand, and I see those connections. Okay, so I'm just going to spend one moment doing this. Go ahead, go up in the um, box for you're going to type, and just type in hell for a moment. Click. First time we actually see the word hell is Deuteronomy 32:22. I'm going to click on it. Uh, the 3222. And 
Do 3222 again. I want to go to interlinear. Scroll. So go. This is what's called interlinear. So it's all the root words is showing you. So I want to look for that word hell. It's right here, 7585. You scroll just up. Actually, it's twice. It's right there twice. So that Hebrew word is Sheol. And it's the same as the word for grave. Now, my wondering is why are we actually going to translate it as hell? Why? And interesting enough, there's actually going to be verses in the Psalms where it's going to happen two times, and one time they're going to say hell, and one time they're going to say Sheol. Why? Why? I don't understand. And then in the New Testament, the word is... Now, do you know this word? So Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A, is from a place called the Valley of Hinnon. It's where the Israelites would sacrifice um, their firstborn son. Uh, they would burn them in the fire to Molech. Later, it became a place of trash. Um, if you had uh, broken pottery, you would throw it there. If there was, um, it was always burning. So there were things that you saw that you wanted to get rid of, you would just throw it into that valley. Um, Messiah actually talks about it again and again. Why they translate it as hell, I don't know. And I'm just giving that now. We're actually going to go deeper into this next time. But I just want to share now to say there is no word in the Hebrew or the Greek that is hell. It's either Sheol, which is grave, and even David talks about, talks about going to Sheol. So it's not a bad place specifically. And then Gehenna was a specific place. Thirdly, just for you to start studying now, because we'll talk about it, Messiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Revelation talk about a second death. There's a death of the body and a death of the soul or the spirit. Well, if I'm living forever, I'm going to name that death, but you're not, you're not dying. You're in pain, but you're not dying. You, you don't die. And specifically, again, Messiah says, do not be afraid of one who can kill the body. Be afraid of the one who can come and destroy the soul. Well, yes, what I'm going to show you is just the idea that at the end you may go off to be with him forever, life. Or he may say, done. And that's a destruction of the soul and there's nothing. There's no more pain. There's no more tears. There's no more 
tormenting or punishing is done. Again, we're going to focus on that next time. Yes, much of the believing world just accepts, oh, there's hell, it's in the scriptures, it's real, it's truth. I don't accept that. I want to see it in the scriptures. I want to understand it. And if there's a second death, I want to look at the connection. I want to see all those places. Does that make sense? All right, let me go ahead and pray. Father, your word is perfect. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you that you walk with us and you teach us and you punish us and you um, encourage us. We thank you that you never run away. We run away, but you never run away. And you never disappear. Maybe we don't see you, but you're, but you're here with us. We ask that you continue to show us your truth. Open our eyes to see truth. To see you. To know you and you alone. We thank you and we praise you. Amen, amen. And off. Um, so at this point, that part's done.